Good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. My name is Lauren Wenzel. I'm the director of the National Marine Protected Area Center at NOAA. And I'm very pleased to be co-hosting this event today with uh, our friends at OCTO. Um, today, we have uh, with us several speakers, and we're delighted to welcome them. I will introduce them in a moment. But the topic is Shifting Seas, Shifting Boundaries, Dynamic Marine Protected Area Designs for a Ch Changing Climate. So this is a very timely topic. We're hearing a lot of interest in the idea of dynamic MPAs. So we're really um, happy to have some experts here who can help us dive into this topic. I'm going to introduce them in just a moment. Um, but before I do, I just wanted to remind you all that after the presentation, we are going to have Q&A. So please be sure to use the question box on the webinar interface. You can do that at any time. And we will go ahead and go through the questions at the end of the presentation, uh, questions or comments. So we look forward to hearing from you and making this a real dialogue. Um, and so now I will go ahead and introduce our speakers. Uh, we have two speakers and then we have an additional uh, two participants who are going to be involved in the Q&A section. Uh, so Dr. Talia Penbrenk is a geospatial social scientist and the geospatial coordinator of the Greater Atlantic Region of NOAA Fisheries. Her expertise is in marine and coastal socio-ecological systems, offshore wind projects and fisheries policy, marine protected areas, place meaning, and marine spatial planning. Dr. Tenbrink works with regulatory, nonprofit, scientific, and academic communities, and is a research associate at the University of Rhode Island. For her dissertation, she interviewed commercial and recreational fishermen around the first offshore wind farm in the United States, and has worked in the environmental field in academic, consulting, nonprofit, and government sectors. We also have Tu Nguyen, a postdoctoral fellow at Dalhousie University, who is part of the Ocean Nexus Center. She is an environmental and natural resource economist, and her research applies economic methods to understand the complex trade-offs between development, conservation, and restoration in land, coastal, and ocean management. And then we also have two additional researchers who are going to be part of the Q&A session. Sarah Roberts, who is a fourth year PhD candidate at Duke University in the Marine Geospatial Ecology Lab led by Pat Halpin. Her research focuses on modeling the impacts of climate change and fishing on ecological communities from fish in the North Atlantic to pelagic sharks in the Eastern Tropical Pacific. And then Juliano Palacios Abrantes is a postdoctoral researcher at the Jenkins Lab for the University of Wisconsin. His work looks at how shifts in marine species are having uncertain feedbacks on marine ecosystems and dependent fishing communities, accentuating sources of conflict over shared marine resources and highlighting the need for adaptive, collaborative, ecosystem-based management strategies. I also want to acknowledge Anne Mook, an assistant professor um, at the uh, university in Kazakhstan. Uh, she can't be with us due to uh, poor internet connections and travel, but uh, she also participated in the project. So I'm now happy to turn it over to Dr. Tenbrink to, to kick us off. Thanks. Thank you so much, Lauren, for introducing us. Um, we're happy to be here. And, and uh, Juliano and Sarah, our co-authors, will be happy to take questions too at the end. So um, our project is Shifting Seas, Shifting Boundaries, Dynamic Marine Protected Area Designs for a Changing Climate. And you can look up the research paper here, help you to find out more uh, about this presentation. So marine protected areas are a spatial planning strategy. They aim to protect species and habitat from harmful human activities. So just as there would be a natural park uh, on land, they're essentially a park in the ocean that serve to constrain human activities in those areas and protect species in those areas. They can positively impact biomass, density, size, species diversity, and uh, positively impact recreational and spiritual values. However, climate change is happening and that causes uh, fish species to move. So this figure from NOAA and Rutgers University shows how black sea bass in green here is moving northward along the coast as well as red hake and American lobster. So these species are moving northward due to warming ocean waters, and that can be an issue for these marine protected areas. As climate change leads to shifting distributions, the current marine protected areas are static. So they may not be able to protect those species in the same way. 
will current MPAs be able to protect species on the move? So to do that, we looked at uh, four different types, well, actually six different types of MPAs, static, dynamic, square, and network. And you can see the static ones are marine protected areas that are stationary, so not moving um, due to climate change, uh, temperature changes. The dynamic MPAs are the shifting uh, orientations. We also were interested in network MPAs because networks can function in landscape ecology as corridors for movement. So we wanted to see if these corridors or these networks were helpful for the species. This paper evaluated the MPA designs under climate change with six different MPA designs. So those ones as well as horizontal and vertical orientations. It uses a simulation and theoretical ecosystem modeling. So it's really hard, obviously, to compare um, entirely species that are not being modeled. Um, and so exploring benefits of dynamic MPAs to respond to effects of climate change in terms of biomass catch and revenue was the goal. So our goals were to determine how MPA outcomes vary under climate change and evaluate how these different MPA designs perform uh, in different scenarios. To achieve this, we used the spatially explicit model in EcoSpace, which is part of the ecosystem modeling software EcoPath with EcoSim. We adapted this theoretical ecosystem uh, called Anchovy Bay with the climate change impact of a change in projected sea surface temperature. We modeled the years 2000 to 2100 and calculated biomass catch and revenue for 2090 to 2100. We focused on no-take MPAs. So that means that these orientations in these areas, there was no fish being caught. We focused on dynamic and network MPAs, vertical, horizontal, and square orientations. So again, we because it was a model, we had to ignore things like pH levels or habitat uh, and really use the, were constrained to the model itself. However, uh, this was due to um, a lack of data availability, but the model itself did result in several interesting findings. So this is a conceptual figure of the methods that we used. And you can see on the upper left that we used a warming scenario from the IPCC, the uh, RCP 8.5. So in total, that was a, about a four degrees Celsius uh, change in sea surface temperature by the end of the 21st century. And we fit it with the MPA designs, which you can see below that, um, to this ecosystem model. So this ecosystem model includes predator-prey relationships between different functional groups, including the fishing fleets. So you can see in the model shrimpers, trawlers, signers, uh, foragers, as well as phytoplankton and anchovy and cod. This model incorporated the price elasticity on the right here when estimating uh, fishing fleet dynamics. So this helped us figure out how with more catch, the price would change. And we used existing literature for that. The outputs of the model are abundance, catch, and fisheries revenue in each time step for each functional group and fishing fleet. So increased revenue would be due to spillover. So the more biomass within the uh, no-take MPA can cause a spillover that would have increased catches around the MPA. So I'm going to hand it over to Tu to talk about uh, the methods and results. Okay, uh, thanks, Talia. Um, my name is Tu, and I'm going to be continue to share a little bit more about our method. So, in our model, we account for dispersal as well as predator-prey interactions among the species. We also estimate um, climate change using. Uh, sea surface temperature change based on the IPCC climate scenario RCP 8.5, which is the trajectory that the world is currently on. And we calculate revenue as a product of catch and price. Now, as Talia mentioned, the default price is from EcoPath, and the price elasticity of supply ratios uh, numbers are taken from the literature. 
the price elasticity of supply helps us calculate the price as supply changes, and it shows how much prices change in response to a change in supply or catch of species. Now on the right here are some of the species that are included in our analysis. And as you can see, we include quite a wide range of different types of species. Um, next, please. Now we test six different types of uh, MPA designs and we compare biomass, cash and revenue in these designs scenarios versus a no MPA scenario. Uh, the six designs include four static MPA designs, horizontal static, network static, square static, and vertical static, as well as the two dynamics, which are network dynamic and square uh, dynamic. And they shift um, northward or upward with the temperature change. And all these designs cover the same uh, area. They just have different shapes. Now, so that's the method. And uh, let's take a look at the results and what we find. Now this first figure here shows a distribution of biomass in different MPA scenarios, as well as the no MPA scenario, which is on the far left by year 100 or 2100. Um, so the cooler or the blue tone denotes lower biomass and the red color denotes higher biomass. And we can see that within MPA boundaries, there, there is an increase in biomass which is not really surprising since fishing is uh, not allowed within these areas. Um, so the next figure that we're gonna show here is a catch of uh, fish in MPA design scenarios versus no MPAs. Now, as we can see, since um, by year 2100, the, all the MPAs are assumed to be no tech. The area within MPA boundaries have zero catch is very obvious. Um, there are some concentrated areas outside the MPA the boundaries that look like they have higher catch because they are in red. Now, one good thing that these uh, illustrations do is that they show us a distribution, but it's, it might be unclear to see what the aggregate effects might be. So what we did is that we went ahead and we aggregated the biomass catch and revenue across um, all cells in our simulated ocean. Now this figure shows the percentage change in biomass catch and revenue between the six MPA scenarios versus the baseline of no MPA scenario. And we can see that there's no single de design that outperforms all measures. Um, next. In terms of biomass, the difference in biomass between MPA scenarios versus no MPA scenario are actually very small and only square shifting MPA uh, scenario has a statistically significant the greater biomass compared to no MPA. Now in terms of catch, catch across all MPA scenarios are higher under MPA versus no MPA. Now this can seem counterintuitive, but keep in mind that this is what uh, result of our modeling technique and our explanation is that although the MPA is, um, are closed off of fishing, the spillover effects result in higher cash and more than make up for this lack of fishing within MPA boundaries. Uh, now in terms of revenues, we can see that revenues in all MPA scenarios are actually lower than in the no MPA scenario. This may seem puzzling because catches are higher while revenue is lower, right? Now, there can be two reasons for this. First, although the catches are higher, it could be that catches of low value species such as anchovy and whiting are driving these increases, while catches of high value species like shrimp are actually lower in the MPA models. And second, the second reason is when the catch increases, due to price elasticity of supply, price actually de decreases, which could lead to lower revenue when the supply for these species are price elastic. So in other words, revenues are a product of cash and prices, and the increase in cash do not compensate for the decrease in prices. Now, um, let's compare across MPA designs. 
uh, specifically between the static and dynamic designs. Um, next, please. The first thing that we can notice is that the square shifting MPA or the square dynamic outperforms the square static MPA across all measures, biomass, cash, and revenue. And the next thing between static and dynamic network MPAs uh, is that we can see that they perform sort of similarly across all measures. It may look like network static MPA has slightly high, higher biomass, but the difference is actually not statistically significant. And finally, we can see that the square shifting MPA outperforms both network MPAs on all measures. Now let's zoom in and look at species specific results. As I mentioned previously, the spillover effects increase catches in areas adjacent to the MPAs, and this can be seen for species that specifically thrive within MPAs. However, the predator prey interactions may dampen the effects of increasing biomass. Now, taken all together, at the end of the day, there's some winners and losers. One particular winner that is that jumps out and is very obvious is anchovy, which experiences significantly higher biomass, especially in non-network MPA um, scenarios. Now, um, next another winner is uh, whiting, which has higher biomass. However, the revenue are slightly smaller, and we suspect that this might be because um, uh, whiting's revenue uh, supply is actually price elastic, so the increase in biomass and cash um, could actually lead to decrease in, in prices and thus revenue. Now, moving on to the losers or the species that do not do so well. Um, the, a species that actually experiences sharply reduced biomass is macro. We can see that their biomass is actually in decreases by a lot and we think that this might be due to predator prey interactions now specifically mackerel's main predator may have increased in biomass because of their protection within the mpas leading to them um, feeding on more mackerels and the end result is that we see macro biomass decreases now um to sum up on fishery results we can see from this results that catches are higher and revenues are overall lower under MPA designs versus a no MPA scenario. And this might be because the lower value species are being caught and the increases in catch may lead to lower prices or else being equal. The higher biomass also means that there can be higher catches with the same fishing effort and uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Talia for the rest of the discussion and conclusion. Thanks, too. So, as you see, um, there's really no silver bullet. There are some winners and losers in terms of the different species. The square shifting uh, was shown to be the best to mitigate climate change impact as they cover a larger temperature gradient. Uh, and we did find that under climate change, marine protected areas could provide regional benefits in terms of biomass. Um, the MPA scenarios did not outperform the no MPA scenarios in terms of revenues, but the trade-offs are actually species protection and greater biomass, which we did find. We also found that vertical MPA orientation was good. However, it wasn't uh, as successful as the square shifting. So some other key messages are the potential benefits of MPAs is complicated by predator-prey interactions and shifting fishing effort. In this model, the MPA modifies a previously fished system, which exacerbates the predator-prey interaction. For example, mackerel may have even less biomass in an MPA scenario without fishing due to increased whales in the MPA because whales prey on mackerel. So we really did find that the Macro distribution uh, changed significantly. Um, this would be an, this is interesting to kind of think about for the high existing fishing effort in the model. How 
this will be less of a problem far from the coast, such as in the high seas. So that could be a potential space to increase uh, marine protected areas or if the marine protected areas are not covering uh, valuable habitat, actually shifting those marine protected areas. So there's definitely a need to consider these interactions in managing and implementing MPA designs. So our limitations are that this model addressed climate change as sea surface temperature and did not address issues like changing pH levels or acidification. It was not an empirical analysis, so the results are demonstrative of potential and not literal outcomes. Finally, this model did not account for potential non-compliance of fishing effort in the no-take MPA boundary. So we didn't have any enforcement issues, obviously. So in conclusion, some key takeaways are that there is no optimal solution and different MPA designs can bring regional benefits in biomass and catch. The dynamic single MPA outperforms the dynamic or static network MPAs. Uh, this may be because of the size of the network MPAs, but it's definitely worth considering. Consider effects of species interactions and released fishing pressures on the goals of your MPA. So for example, if the goal of your MPA is to protect a single species, think about how that would work with the predator-prey dynamics in terms of considering whether to use a dynamic or shifting marine protected area. So I'm gonna give some thanks to our funders, the National Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center, or SUSINC, at the University of Maryland, and of course, the NOAA National Marine Protected Areas Center for sponsoring this webinar. To find out more about this work, you can read our article here at PLOS One, or send an email to two or I, or start a conversation on Twitter. All of our Twitter handles are here. We have some discussion questions too, uh, if there's time at the end. Okay, thank you so much, Talia and Tu. That, that was really interesting, and I'm looking forward to hearing um, some questions. So I'm gonna uh, take a look here in our question box, which we do have a few, which is terrific. Um, the first one is, um, how will shifting MPAs play into NOAA's response to the recent climate executive order? And I'm going to just let you know right now, often we get very enthusiastic and informed uh, participants. So some of these may be a little bit outside the scope of your research. Um, and feel free to comment uh, as an individual or, or pass if you wish. Um, but I think uh, in particular, there's a section of the Climate EO that asks about resilience of, of fisheries and protected resources to climate impacts. And that's what this, this questioner is, is referring to and wanting to know, um, how does your study relate to the shifting of fishing leases and the availability of processing resources and the economics of also um, human pressures on fisheries? That's a great question. I think that, unfortunately, this study doesn't specifically uh, assess that, but I think that that's something that definitely needs to be considered if you're thinking about whether changing your MPA to a um, to a to a shifting one, and definitely looking at changing stakeholders over time. So, for example, if you have a marine protected area in New England, thinking about um, how you're going to manage for having uh, mid-Atlantic fishers come up, you know, chasing the species that they're used to catching. Great. Uh, another question uh, for the for the dynamic MPAs. How much did you assume that they moved? Uh, how often and how fast? Um, so for the dynamic MPAs, we assume that they. So so the, our world or our simulation ocean is a 20, 20, 20 by twenty um, grid, and the MPA, the dynamic ones, move up one grid every ten years in our one hundred year. Can horizon. Okay, thanks very much. Um, a question about how are the revenues computed? Um, shouldn't the change in biomass be brought about by the no-take MPAs 
and wouldn't those be considered? I, I think you addressed this, but if you could just explain your your, your findings related to revenues. Uh, sure. So the revenue is a product of price times catch. And when biomass increases, as uh, our model uh, predicts, then um, the spillover effects would mean that there could be more catch given the same amount of fish fishing effort. Now, holding everything else constant, when there's more fish, there's more catch, so there's more fish, the prices for those fish could decrease because there's more supply in the market. And that might lead to a decrease in revenue. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, what are some of the requirements to apply this work to other species in context or build on it with additional data? Sarah, do you want to take that? Yeah, sure. I think one interesting thing about this project is that we used eco space and um, eco path and eco sim, and there are some you know, a lot of existing um, ecosim and ecospace models for particular areas that uh, something like this could be applied to, you know, like the Gulf of Maine, if you have a ecosystem model for that, um, thinking about incorporating climate change effects and potential uh, restricted fishing areas would be a really good next step to do in a not theoretical ecosystem, I think. But the data requirements are pretty severe to make these models. So that's why we started with theoretical. Right. And were you saying that uh, this ecosystem was similar uh, to, a, to a real life ecosystem in terms of species and, and characteristics? It's similar, but it's not based off of any particular area. So the species interactions are based on true interactions in the literature, but it's not based off of any actual space on the globe. Thanks. So I think what Sarah is saying is like um, there have been similar models developed for places like the Gulf of Maine. However, we're, we weren't able to use those because of the data requirements. So, you know, fleshing out those like half simulation based on real place models would would be a very interesting way to expand on this work. Can you explain a little bit more about how the shifting occurs? What is the factor that controls the shift to new space? Um, and, and can you also talk about the spatial coverage of the MPAs, like how much of the area they take up? Uh, I think, and Sarah, you can jump in and correct me if I'm wrong. I think that they cover 10% of the our simulated ocean and the reason for that is that we've seen the commitment to make 10 percent of the ocean um, protected from fishing um, they just move literally like one step up every 10 years they're not optimized to move exactly with the species and the reason for that is that we have a lot of uh, as you can see we have a lot of species and species interactions within our models so it would have been it wasn't possible uh, numerically to optimize the movement of the MPAs to any species. Yeah, and just to jump in about what this actually means in space is we had a 20 by 20 grid, so that's 400 total cells, and each grid cell is 20 kilometers by 20 kilometers. So um, each, as two was saying, each time it steps up, it moves um, 20 kilometers, which is kind of can um, akin to what they're seeing and shifting now, which I think is about 15 kilometers per decade projecting. So um, we try to to be similar. And I can, if I can jump in, in terms of the, um, I am Julian, I'm sorry that my video is off, but the internet is not good. Um, in terms of the actual uh, species shifting, we, so the, the model uh, estimates the, we, we did a forcing and um, function um, that would affect the species ability to um, to find prey. And so the species are limited by how much they um, their mobility based on, on literature and the way the, the way they it, they are influenced and how much they shift the species themselves based on on, on the ability of prey. 
Thanks. Um, here's a comment. Uh, thank you for a great presentation. What you just said about thinking about the goals of MPAs is critically important and something often lost in discussions about how to maximize MPA expansion. I would put defining goals and articulating measurable objectives as a first order exercise following a problem scoping that defines why an MPA may be needed. And, and I would just add, I think your, your study also really highlights the complexity of ecosystem considerations like predator prey, interactions, and market forces, which um, I think sometimes are left out of MPA discussions. Will you run the model for different sizes of MPAs, or did you consider a scenario with fixed with a fixed MPA protecting static features and a moving MPA that moved with shifting species? I think the only way that we attempted to look at size was having sort of the networks, which was a couple of small, and then the one large. MPA and we did see that the one large MPA performed better shifting instead of a lot of small ones um, but we didn't go as far as protecting certain species one way and other species a different way I think that would have added some complexity but it's also a really interesting next step to think about and do you have a hypothesis about why the larger um, dynamic MPA uh, performed better than the dynamic network um, I think what we, we think is because when there is a network of MPAs and there's areas between these MPAs that are unprotected, um, the increase in biomass will spill over and then fishery will just capitalize on that and go in between these areas and catch whatever that is spilling over. Whereas when you have one large MPAs, um, there's not as much adjacent areas for fishermen or fishery to go and catch all the fish. So a lot of questions about um, the interest in, in applying this to real places, uh, recognizing the data requirements that you all have, have noted, um, and then also uh, different kinds of scenarios that could potentially be run. Um, another question is, is how did you decide to shift the MPA at one block every 10 years? Did this respond to the IPCC data in some way? Um, and have you considered moving the MPAs to specific hotspots? So we decided the, um, sorry, Juliana, if you want to jump into the one block, 20 kilometers every 20 years was similar to, so there you've got 15 kilometers per decade um, and 25 kilometers per decade for a different, for a low and a high submission scenario. So 20 is in between those um, in the IPCC. And that's how we decided that. I, I don't know about the second part of that question. <laughs> Okay. Um, another question was, uh, have you considered modeling MPAs that have partial restrictions so that they're not fully no-take, but maybe multiple use with some fishing restrictions, since that is how many um, marine protected areas operate, in, um, at least in the US? Yeah, so I think that, you know, we really couldn't find much information on the the success of dynamic MPAs. So that's why we did this project. I think we didn't really get into the complexities of different um, things like partial restrictions or different uh, constellations of MPA orientations and designs. And so I think that those are really interesting um, things to, to look at. And I think that, you know, when you're looking or thinking about a specific marine protected area and planning for the future, you it is like someone mentioned before, returning back to those goals and trying to optimize the predator prey interactions, the, uh, you know, the fishing in the area for those goals, you know, using kind of the fact that shifting MPAs do work to a certain extent. So um, in terms of thinking about partial restrictions, there are, I don't think that there was a way that we could have known exactly how certain restrictions would have impacted the ecosystem and that really go goes back to more ecosystem assessments and stock assessment kind of literature thanks 
Um, is, is NOAA or are you aware of other um, management agencies who are considering uh, non-static MPAs? And do, are you aware of the legal tools to put such a, a tool in place? I, I definitely, I remember reading some for specific species like um, sea turtles, I think in California, there's also um, dynamic management areas, which are often used in um, fisheries management. So in the Northeast, which I'm familiar with, there's uh, dynamic management areas for right whales, and those aren't completely no take, but um, it, I think that the fishing industry, if they're on board, can be flexible to shifting areas because it's what they do already for, um, for stocks. Um, yeah, but, I'm not familiar like with how NOAA would would start this process. Maybe you could speak to that. <laughs> I think we probably need a whole separate webinar to, to look into that. It would be an interesting follow-up. Um, can you elaborate on the difference between horizontal and vertical MPAs uh, and, uh, and just discuss some of the distinctions and outcomes related to shape? Sure, I, I can, I can, okay, I can okay. jump on that. Oh, go ahead, too. You want to go for it? No, 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 no. <laughs> um, the, um, I guess the main, the main difference between the the vertical and the on the horizontal MPAs. I mean, as the name said, it's the it's the direction of the MPA. So when we looked at the literature and the hypothesis was that um. Mo many of the of current MPAs are designed horizontally to cover within the latitudinal range of the species. And so we thought, well, if literature suggests that climate change is overall uh, pushing species forward, um, what if we simply start actually flipping, flipping the MPAs and just actually uh, making a vertical, vertical design? So rather than Longitudinally in length, uh, latitudinally, and so that would uh, that would uh, yeah hypothetically cover the distribution of the um, of the of the species if it is um, if it was poleward rather obviously in in cases where the species is following um, local climate gradients that are not necessarily poleward or going to uh, deeper waters that would that would not necessarily um, be the case, right? Like the species would would uh, not necessarily move within the NPA. Uh, so was that was kind of the basic uh, difference uh, between those um, those two those two designs. We have a couple of questions about about noncompliance and enforcement. Um, you mentioned that noncompliance was not considered in this model, but it seems like shifting MPA would be di more difficult to enforce because people already have a hard time noting understanding where existing MPAs are that don't move. Are there plans to include this human factor in, in future studies? And how can this be considered in research? So I've seen I think that's... Uh, oh. Go on to. Yeah, I will go first and then Talia can add. Um, so I've seen in the literature, um, in modeling, in models, um, sometimes non-compliance is um, model sort of somewhat simply simplistically as a percentage of um of like complete like let's say complete compliance is 100 percent um then somewhat non-compliance could be like 80 or 70 percent of protection and um that is something that if we wanted to we, we this is something that could be included in the model but i agree that Anything I, I don't know how realistic that is, and anything beyond that would be might be too complex for the model to handle when it comes to humans and compliance. Thanks. Another question relates to fleet dynamics. Um, I wonder, did you consider the fleet dynamics in this research? Are fleet distributions are fleets distributions shifting with the change of species distributions? And can you talk a little bit more about interactions between fishing activities and MPA design? Uh, 
so I think obviously in the model, the 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 fishers go where the fish are, uh, and so they are changing um, in in response to that. Um, yeah, I think it was a really interesting question about that I hadn't thought of before in terms of shifting um, marine protected areas and difficulties with enforcement. I wonder if things like uh, updated technology uh, will allow maybe fishermen to have a more uh, a, a better understanding of where they are at all times. Um, and obviously, it really depends also on the socio-cultural situation of the fisheries um, in terms of how flexible or adaptable or uh, how the communication is between the managers and the fishers. So I think there's a lot of interesting ways to approach these topics. We have a couple of questions. Oh, go ahead, please. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in in the last two questions uh, regarding the the dynamic and the complexity of the of the human uh, side of the dynamics. I I agree that it's, it 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 would it would be quite challenging for um, for I don't know for fishers communities to following these these uh, changes. And, I mean, there's two things. One, there are some examples not necessarily in the U.S. where other type of dynamic, um, spatial dynamic tools have been in place. So I believe in Australia, they set a line below X or Y latitude where uh, the fishery uh, cannot go and that line moves. And uh, fishers that uh, I, I would assume most of the, of, of the fleet has some uh, AIS data or some uh, GPS data. And, and so the, they, they, they can follow that, that change. Um, and for example, in Mexico, in the in, Cal in the Gulf of California, there's some uh, more commune-based uh, fishery refuge, that's how we call it. And the, the idea of this tool is that is, they're like two to four years MPA. So we, one we can, can consider dynamic is you put it one to four years and then you can move it to another place. Um, and because these are community-based and these are small scale fishers, they don't in many times they don't actually need GPS for big technology because they know their fishing grounds. Um, in terms of compliance, in that case, it will be hard. But in terms of, uh, as Tal was saying, maybe in, in places where technology AS data is, is increasing and boats have a way to track their movement, um, that could work. Um, and just to jump into, into the last question in terms of uh, fisheries uh, effort. So in the model, um, we fishing effort is distributed based on the cost model. And so fishers will decide where to fish based on the distance from the fishing port, uh, the price of their of the target that or the like of the species of their target, and they are they're projected to maximize uh, profit. So they would they would move at as the it's as the as the ecosystem move as the as the model moves through time. Thanks. I want to remind everyone that the um, Zach has gone ahead and put a link to the paper in the chat. So if you want to take a look at the paper, the the link is there. It is open access. Um, we do have a couple of questions about um, about benthic habitat. Um, one asking, you know, could protection for sessile benthic organisms such as corals and sponges be lost with dynamic MPAs? And a related question um, that we know species productivity and biomass depends on habitat. Um, do we have any? Do you have any plans to include um, some benthic habitats into your model? I think because yeah, most of our species were mobile that we didn't incorporate the importance of benthic habitat on species that require those habitats or on the habitat themselves. Um, sorry, the, yeah, the impacts of climate change on that. And so I do think that there is going to be a differential effect on mobile versus sessile species, which we've seen in the literature already, um, which might be a, another reason that different shapes of marine protected areas could come into play, thinking about large networks, small um, 
and we don't have plans to incorporate habitat in this model, but again, that's another great follow-up study for something like this or for a particular ecosystem. Yeah, and I would just add, related to the benthic habitat question, a, a comment that, um, you know, this, this study really tended to focus on fisheries interactions with MPAs, um, with biomass and catch being some of the parameters that you looked at. I think there would be interest in seeing uh, other parameters like diversity or um, biodiversity parameters that are more uh, typically associated with marine protected areas uh, because they really are um, generally established for biodiversity conservation more than fisheries. Just, just a, a comment kind of building on some of the, the habitat comments. Yeah, if I can just comment on that and, and add a, a bit on Sarah's uh, comment. Definitely uh, looking at other other uh, benefits of of MPA more for conservation in terms of uh, biodiversity would would be great. It will also require um, way more uh, data on different uh, of, on the species. So you so you could have a, 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 a richer ecosystem in one mistake. So that goes back to the discussion we have previously of actually applying some of this work to uh, ecosystem, uh, eco team or ecosystem, other ecosystem models that are already built with, uh, that are rich in information from a local site. Um, and in terms of, 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 the, of, the, of the benthic areas, we, what we were trying, we, we just assumed that the whole uh, area was the, um, was the habitat of the species because we wanted to see how would the how the species and everything will, will respond to free movement? But obviously, when you have um, limitations on on where the species are going to move, um, it's important to to think of well, well, you can have a shifting MPA sure that that follows the uh, the climate gradient, but if the if the substrate that the species is affinated to is not moving, then um, the species will more likely um, move there. Yeah. And I think one of the comments that I have seen in um, in real world MPA design conversations has been around the idea of protecting species, uh, sorry, features in the marine environment like canyons and seamounts that don't move, complemented by dynamic uh, measures that that provide that additional flexibility. So I think that that hybrid model may be something that. Um, that managers may be more interested in in the future as well. Yeah, I think that's a great a great point. I can definitely see how that would be extremely valuable having these historic places that are based on on the benthic habitat, and then you do get to some of those more network issues of like travel um, that would be interesting too. So speaking about uh, data requirements. Uh, uh, we have a question based on your results. Do you have any recommendations for folks trying to link MPAs to fisheries production empirically, such as methods, considerations, et cetera? Were there any glaring data gaps in the model that could be improved through empirical work? You have an opportunity here to... Uh, can, can you say that again? Sorry, I wasn't sure what part of the methods they were looking for specifically. I don't can know, I guess I was asking, was there any data set you really wished you had as you were going through this, this work that would, would really help um, further ground it or advance it in, in future analysis? So I think one of the, one of the limitations that we found at the time of doing this search was to the actual incorporation of climate change into uh, ecosystem and uh, eco uh, space. Um, so, for example, we only included. This is why the um, the, the climate change simulation was uh, just like a theoretical increase, linear increase uh, forward, and why we only consider sea surface temperature and we didn't consider uh, maybe to surface temperature and, and bottom um, and sea bottom temperatures and all and even other variables um, that it's not only uh, temperature so that was I think that is one a great limitation when you think about how to actually implement this on a more 
particular way, at least from, from the climate change um, perspective. And of uh, Saren too, I think we're probably want to incorporate something else. Uh, I have one comment that says, thank you for your work on predator-prey interactions. I have been looking for something along these lines and I will be citing you. Uh, Great. And then, <laughs> always nice to get the thumbs up. And then another question, um, I probably missed this, but how important is the, oh, sorry, no, it's a different question. Did you all say that you found no st statistically significant change in biomass between static and dynamic MPAs? If so, do you take away from this that static versus dynamic is not relevant in terms of biomass? I think the only um, dynamic MPA that made a difference in terms of biomass was the square shifting. And in the network, static versus dynamic, we did not see a difference. And I think one reason to, for that goes back to the predator-prey interaction and what kind of species are we calculating? because MPAs, when they move, they might protect certain species that move with the temperature. But there may be other species that are being left out of the areas that were previously um, being protected and are no longer protected. And on top of that, because of predator-prey interactions, now the, um, the newly moving MPA could be protecting species that were previously not being protected. So I, I think it, the, one of our takeaways message is to be very clear on what species or what goals um, you're trying to set when designing an MPA because of all these, all these uh, interactions that go on and that could lead to unintended uh, outcomes when designing dynamic MPAs. Um, another question, do you think it's likely that shifting MPAs will be a possibility in the high seas, given that we do not yet have a legal mechanism for MPAs in areas beyond national jurisdictions? Kind of straying into the policy realm here. Yeah, well, we did, in a, in a related work, we did look at uh, high seas MPAs. I think it's the Charlie Gibbs uh, high sea MPA that's not completely no take i think it's only just bottom trawling or something like that but uh yeah i think that there is more that needs to be done i would say globally to to work on new um new agreements to to help protect high seas areas if i can uh jump on that as well um so i think from a from a positive perspective <laughs> Um, yes, they can be, um, but from a negative perspective, things need to move on quicker than right now. Like, for example, the meetings from uh, UN meetings from uh, areas beyond national jurisdiction, um, they need need to move uh, forward to actually um, agreeing on 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 something. And then the high seas does provide. Uh, I guess has the facility that the fact that vessels have AIS data, and so you could potentially have uh, in like current at least visualization of where fishing vessels are fishing. Um, on the other hand, obviously there's a policy implication that uh, onclos and uh, sorry, like the laws on on the high seas are not necessarily uh, uh, binding. So it's not that um, there's there's complications and actually penalizing uh, illegal activities uh, on the high sea. So it's complex, but I don't know, one has to stay positive. <laughs> yeah, and I think to add on to Giuliano, you know, one, if there wasn't all those crazy legal frameworks that you had to deal with, um, high seas fisheries usually target pelagic species, and those are ones that we see shifting and that these dynamic marine protected areas might be the most suited for, like we've been talking about. And so that might be a really good opportunity to test some of these things for protecting um, species that large pelagic species. Yeah, one of our uh, commenters notes that we do have some MPAs, as you mentioned, Charlie Gibbs, uh, for high seas that are managed by regional fishery management organizations and certainly uh, dynamic MPAs could be a tool that could be uh, employed by these organizations as well. 
uh, a comment uh, just commending you on including price elasticity in this model and really glad to see models that are more holistic and inclusive of fisheries economics and conservation. This is really important to help us move forward with sustainable fisheries. Uh, let me just see if there's things we haven't touched on here yet. Um, I think uh, just just some general comments on on uh, enforcement. Uh, more generally around MPAs um, in general um, and on and on mobile MPAs that are being used, for example, for turtle protection in Hawaii um, that, that may be uh, real life models that people can look at. Uh, and, and also comments uh, on interest in incorporating habitat models into this work, um, as mentioned earlier. I think the other question that's come up is how can horizontal or square MPAs be no take with no vertical component? Are they only looking at surface fishing gear? Um, I think this this question may get at the three dimensionality of of the um, of the MPAs, and I um, I assume when you talk about no take, you're talking about no take um, across the whole 3D profile of the MPA. Is that right? Yeah. Because that is yes. that is another aspect of MPA management in terms of multiple use has been um, vertical zoning, so where uh, some take is allowed in the water column but not on the bottom, et cetera. Oh, no, sorry, we, we, the vertical we meant just literally uh, the like the design of the, the the shape of the of the of the MPA, whether it will follow a longitudinal gradient or a longitudinal gradient. Right. Okay, I feel like we have covered most of the questions here. If people have one or two more questions you wanna send in while our speakers are here. And while they're doing that, I'm gonna see if um, if any of our speakers have any kind of final comments they'd like to make as we wrap up. No, I think this was a really, it was a really fascinating discussion. I hope I can get the chat at some point, because can't see it. No, um, I think. <laughs> Yes, and I will say we, there are probably a couple of folks that we didn't get to, um, and and uh, if you all are willing to follow up directly with people or people who have left, um, but I would just I think close by saying that um, there there was a, an excellent comment made about the importance of engaging um, communities and fishermen and other ocean users in MPA design, and that um, these kinds of tools can be a good way of discussing some of the trade-offs that are involved in MPA, MPAs and MPA network design. But uh, mainly, I think what I'm hearing and I would just like to echo is thanks so much to all of you for a really um, fascinating discussion on, on a topic that is really growing in interest and you all have brought a cross-disciplinary approach to it that I think a lot of people are really excited about. So thanks so much. Thank you all. Thank you for thank having you. me. And thanks thank for you. joining us.